This lecture is going to discuss FinTech. So if you would notice at the beginning of this section on Moodle, I had you do a, um, a discussion forum where you tell me a little bit about what you know about FinTech, what classes you've um, discussed FinTech in, and where you know, what personal experience you have with it. So if you haven't done that, please fill that out before watching this lecture. I then also have two websites for you to check out um, that describe the current state of FinTech after you've watched this lecture, but before you view the presentations for these papers. Okay, so in general, what is FinTech? FinTech is any technological innovation that is used to compete with traditional financial intermediaries, um, financial products and services. So you hear a lot about disruption anytime you're talking about FinTech. So what they're saying that what they've done to disrupt it is just kind of shake things up. Like um, any think back years and years ago, credit cards were a huge disruption because before that everyone only ever paid with cash or paid with checks. So these new financial innovations are seen as disruptions um, to make the system more efficient. So we see this in, um, well, the most common ones you're probably familiar with are like Zelle and PayPal, Venmo. Those are going to be in the payment section. We'll also discuss how this is impacting lending and advising. So, you know, you guys are familiar with GoFundMe. Um, and maybe lending club perhaps. So those are the things that we are going to be discussing in here. What does FinTech do? Well, the first thing when you first started to hear about it, it wasn't so much in finance classes, it was more in management type classes where they would discuss the impact of the analysis of large data sets. So the fact that we now have access to so much more data and are, have the computing power to be able to analyze it was making it so that we could um, you know, improve the information that we had when we were making these decisions. But now we've also seen automated trading and advice. So we're going to, you know, you, you know that you can do E-Trade. You don't have to trade, you know, directly through a broker. You can just do it through um, web-based platforms. Um, Robo-advising is the advice side. So you guys sort of started this um, in, or played around with this in 350 when you did your risk assessment and then it gave you an idea of what types of things to invest in that um, is, you know, dipping your toe into experiencing robo-advising, automated peer-to-peer -peer lending. So that would be like um, GoFundMe or Lending Club, and then payment systems and financial record keeping. The financial record keeping, um, you're probably most familiar with blockchain, um, but the automatic payment systems, uh, those are like, uh, click to pay automatically with Apple Pay, things like that. Okay, so I was just interrupted by children. I have no idea what I was saying. But um, mobile payment apps, so like Zelle or PayPal, um, contactless technology, so that would be the idea of you could just tap with Apple Pay or just tap with your Visa card. Um, financial management apps like Intuit's Mint um, that you use for personal budgeting, peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, lending club and GoFundMe, um, crowdfunding also GoFundMe, um, and then foreign currency platforms like FX.com, or you'd also be able to use it for any other, uh, you know, trading if you wanted to trade foreign currencies in any other platform. Okay. So one of the things you hear about when you hear about that idea of disruption is the fact that the reason so many of these apps have been able to come about is the access to increased data and computing power um, and the fact that you have access to a lot of additional data that can help you to make these decisions. So you will hear about how, um, you know, think about when we talked about the insurance companies, right? How you had access to GPS and therefore they knew where you were driving, how much you were driving, how fast you were going, and therefore it made it easier to set your appropriate rates for your insurance. The same kind of thing goes in here. They can see, uh, you know, the robo-advising, if it has access to a lot more of your stuff, it can be more accurate. So a lot of times we, um, 
you know, our actions don't necessarily, or the way we describe ourselves doesn't necessarily um, come out so accurately. But when you give the robo advisors access to additional, you know, pieces of information, they're able to figure out, like, say, your sentiments. Um, how do you really feel about things? You may say that you have a positive outlook, but are most of the tweets that you're giving, um, you know, automatically negative? So they'll say, oh, well, maybe you are a little more risk averse than you may appear, those kinds of things. It's also really beneficial um, for marketing purposes to be able to have access to that data. So that's a major benefit for the companies from that side. Um, so the first thing that you think about usually when you think about um, fintech is going to be blockchain. So I'm sure you're all familiar with blockchain it refers to a computer code based system or a chain of transactions between two parties. Um, it has the dual ledger everyone is able to identify everything is completely secure uh, you know all the normal things that you've heard about completely transparent global everyone trusts it because everyone can track things back through time is this kind of currency isn't manipulated people will say in the same way that like you know the fed just cut rates to zero to manipulate u.s currency there's only a um, certain supply of it and therefore the idea is that um, these transactions such as Bitcoin and Litecoin would be able to maintain their values a little bit better. Well, in reality, you do see them being um, very volatile. So here's a just kind of an idea of all of the fintech things that are out there. So from personal finance perspective, um, I talked about Mint, but you can also see Credit Karma up here. So that's um, more from the security side. Try to see what is your credit score, how accurate is your credit score. Um, from the lending side, Lending Club was the first one, and that's still the one you'll hear about a lot. Um, you also see SoFi and refinancing apps that you can have in there. Um, Venmo for the payment side, PayPal, Square, uh, institutional investors so these are apps that are going to be used in the institutional side in order to you know for companies working with one another from your side um, future advisor was one of the big ones and wealthfront and betterment in the very beginning but now you're starting to see um, more traditional retail advisors also offering these so we will discuss um, these are the robo advising sides and we'll discuss how you can now see this information from wells fargo um, equity financing remittances so this is about getting paid uh, when you swipe your credit card how does that money flow through and a lot of them are now flowing through zoom so we can see all the ones that are up here now robo advising so this is something you'll probably come into contact with um, and you did uh, you did do the risk tolerance test in 350 to get an idea of the types of things that you should be investing in based on your risk tolerance. So robo-advising is a, di a digital platform that uses data algorithms to come up with an automated financial plan with little to no human interaction. It gathers data about your age, current assets, and current debt, and does a risk assessment, and then asks about your short and long-term goals. So that would be the customer profiling. Then what it tries to do is give you an asset allocation. So this is the data that, or this is the point where you stopped in 350. So it would say, like you should invest 50 50 in um, debt and equity and then it will give you a little bit more say you should only invest in triple a rated bonds and you should only invest in blue chip stocks that kind of idea now in 350 i made you do the rest of it on your own but these robo advisors would then go and say all right well here's your asset allocation i will show you what types of stocks and bonds fit that allocation Right, and then you will approve these and it will go ahead and invest in them. It will rebalance anytime there's any sort of change in the economy. So that's the optimization, um, trying to optimize the sharp ratio, your risk return analysis. And then um, it will go back and examine, you know, with a portfolio analysis section. Um, that was the ending part of what you did in 350. So see what were your strengths and weaknesses in your portfolio? Where did you do well? Where did you do poorly? And how might we want to adjust there in the future? So here's a report from Barron's about the different robo-advisors. So this started with robo-advising firms like Wealthfront and Betterment, but now regular commercial investment firms 
um, have been offering these services to their clients. So um, you can see the highest rated one on there was Vanguard, and you can see how they're doing the ratings. So um, Vanguard had a relatively low account minimum. You did have access to actual advisors if you wanted to talk to them. Now you can see the ones that were um, fully online, like Wealthfront, one of the first ones, um, they had access to zero. So um, this is, you know, just showing you the rankings. Um, I believe this is from 2018, so it may have changed. You can go and check out um, Barron's reports each year if they put these out. The next thing to consider, or the next innovation, was in insurance. So we know there's two basic types of insurance, either personal or commercial, and we've seen disruptions in the insurance, insurance area through fintech. Now we've already talked about how you would see it in your auto insurance, uh, but you can, so the personal side is pretty easy to figure out. Um, the commercial side, you know, the cybersecurity was, would be the first one that you would think about going in there, but let's see how it's changing the process. So this is going to apply to both the personal and the commercial side. Um, think about the new sales model. You can get instant online quotes and you can go to one website and you compare quotes. I mean, you see the commercials for those all the time. Um, the uh, price, pricing and underwriting, because they have access to that telemetric data, they can set a, you know, and, you know, maybe your Facebook stuff and your GPS tracking, they can set a much more accurate price. So remember, that's what we talked about in the rate making section. Um, the policy administration and then claims and settlements. So there's, you can take, you know, let's say you wanted to file a claim. Most of the time you want to file a claim, you just open the app on your phone and let's say you just, someone um, hit your car with a shopping cart in the parking lot of the grocery store. So you just take a little picture and you upload it and um, you can file your claim in that way. So that's been a major innovation in that area. Peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, so traditionally, you would just have the borrower and the investor, uh, or the borrower would invest in or borrow directly from a bank, um, and the lender or investor would be the bank itself or the bank using people's money um, that they had in their savings accounts, right? So now with this peer-to-peer -peer lending, you can see the process that it, you know, it flows through. So the borrower applies to the lending club or lending platform for a loan. An investor goes out there and says, yes, I think this is a good investment. So this one is showing from lending club, but you can do the same thing from like Kickstarter or GoFundMe. So you would put the information about why you need the money and they'd say, yeah, I want to sponsor you. I believe in you. I want to invest in that idea. Um, then the money would flow. So you can see the orange line money is going to flow into the platform and then into a bank. Um, the, it's usually an online banking system that's you know going to be the one to clear the process, clear the checks. Um, then this says, yes, we received the money. We're following the orange line, goes to the blue line. The note is received. Um, and then the note gets paid out and you can see the repayment sections here in the red. So how it all flows through the system. And here's a bunch of different lending companies that are gonna be out there. Um, so Lending Club, obviously the first one, On Deck gives business loans, PayPal Working Capital um, is a new one. SoFi is one that you're hearing advertised on um, advertised on, all the time online. So that's going to be usually you'll hear about it for refinancing your student loans or you can actually get student loans through it. Um, there's been some scandals recently with some of these online ones. Some of the data that they're using uh, in order to get this information because they have access to a whole bunch of regular, you know, non traditional data, they're getting in trouble for what would have been called redlining in the past. So redlining was where it became really hard to get a mortgage and a property in an area that was predominantly African-American. Now, um, some of these 
online platforms are getting accused of doing similar kinds of things. They have access to data and they're using it. I mean, they're saying logically, like, this is a higher risk, I should charge a higher rate of return, but that ends up leading to discrimination, which is getting some of them in trouble. So when I've heard about these companies recently, it's, it's been in the news for those kinds of reasons. Um, innovations in payment systems. So, you know, like everything else, payment systems are constantly evolving. And this is something that we discussed in 313 with financial intermediation. So the first major thing was, oh, credit cards, and then ATMs, then the idea of electronic stock trading through Bloomberg, um, bank computer mainframes. So um, banks not actually, you know, uh, having to physically send money, but money being sent online. Um, then everyone else using that in or having access to that same kind of online bill pay with PayPal. And then further digitalizations, like now most of our bills are automatically set up to auto pay um, through our banks. So that's what they're talking about there now. Um, further innovations and in talking about this, so this was the traditional system. Um, you had a sender who would transmit a request to the sending bank. Secure messaging would go back and forth and then your payment would clear. So this is your traditional financial intermediation step. Now what you're seeing um, is this enhancement between the customer, the point of sale, and the merchant. So they're open loop payment systems. These are like the Apple Pay, you just um, hold up your card and it pays automatically. Um, by combining these things, there's less checks that have to go through the system um, and more secure and rapid payments.